Have you thought about where your ideas and beliefs about parenting come from? Have you considered that the relationships you have with others is primarily a nervous system experience? In this conversation, I talk to Erica, who is a conscious parenting coach. She explains the road she takes to get here, including the intense anxiety and reactivity that were part of parenting her firstborn. I imagine many of us can relate to the nervousness and worry that comes with parenting our first child. And while we do not want it to be that way, we can get stuck in patterns and unconscious behaviors. Erica's aha moment came when she found Dr. Shafali's work on conscious parenting and heard her say, quote, parenting is not about raising our children. It's about raising ourselves, end quote. If you think about it, many go into parenting thinking it will be a certain way. We have expectations about how our children will behave, and we imagine they will do as we say without any pushback. Then reality sets in, and we are faced with a decision. Do we stay in this push and pull dynamic where we are battling with our kids, or do we seek to learn and grow so we can build a relationship of connection and love? Ultimately, that is the goal of Erica's work, to help parents connect to their own stories and then build relationships with their children through healing, trust, and harmony. This one is chocked full of nuggets of wisdom and insight. Here is my conversation with Erica Kesselman. All right, Missy. So I am Erica Kesselman, and I'm wife and mama to three magical, beautiful kiddos, ages seven, five, and three. I have two girls and one boy, and we're unschoolers now for about five years. I'm a former public school teacher and administrator, and now I'm a conscious parent coach and certified trauma specialist and breathwork teacher. And I currently am helping parents develop strong and peaceful relationships with their kids without the guilt, without overwhelm or or power struggles. So um, essentially, I'm really a lifelong learner and such a lover of of growth, of change, connection. Um, That's been my journey. That's why I got into education from the beginning. And I love uh, just learning about relationships and getting deeper into understanding human behavior and biology. a little bit about some some facts about me and where my family are in in the world. We were uh, in New Jersey for a little while, and that's where I was actually born and raised. And we did um, my kids were born there, so we recently moved down to Florida so that we could enjoy being outdoors more year round in the warmth and sunshine. Uh, so I love digging my toes in the sand and usually rolling around in the sand with my kiddos. <laughs> building sandcastles, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. And I am so grateful for, for where I've been and kind of learning from all the mistakes of my past. Um, so, so blessed and, um, just, yeah, grateful for my journey into education. I've always had this passion and love for helping others for service, uh, for especially like connecting with younger children. Um, but I've worked with, uh, families who have children of all ages. Um, but just, yeah, practicing that unconditional love and acceptance of myself and, and kids and trying to understand and know one another on a deeper level. Um, so a little bit, I guess, about my backstory um, and how did I get to this place, like moving away from traditional public school setting and into conscious parenting coaching, which is um, absolutely, I found my purpose and passion right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, going way back, I, as I said earlier, you know, I always had this passion for service and, and especially working with families. So I, I mean, I always knew I wanted to have my own children and my husband and I want to have a, have a family. And, um, in the very beginning, it did actually take me years to get pregnant, which that's maybe probably was the start of this higher consciousness, conscious living conscious parenting journey, perhaps, because, you know, I just experienced um, some self-sabotage there and just unprocessed pain, I think, through all of that in the beginning stages. But of course, we were gratefully very blessed with our firstborn, and it was such a joyful and magical time. Um, you know, I'm so sure many new parents can relate to that. But but then something happened really shortly after she was born where I just started to experience a little bit um, of this anxiety in form of like perfectionism and rigidity. And like eventually it turned into this extreme reactivity, um, sometimes like a complete shutdown and collapse. And it, I would just like ended up not really being the type of mom I wanted to be. Um, 
Would you say that happened when she was an infant or was it once she became more vocal and, and mobile? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, it was probably from the very beginning. Like I wanted okay. things to be just perfect. Like I had mm-hmm. that perfectionism in me. And I know that came from just like my societal conditioning and all of that, that stuff that comes with um, perhaps even more so like being in traditional public school setting. Um, you just like kind of wanting to have your ducks in a row and being really organized and punctual. And those are all good qualities, but not to the point where it becomes like super obsessive. And, and then not, with, yeah. And not um, in relationship but, with another human, right? Because you can't right. predict exactly how things are going to unfold. Yeah. And I love how you work, use that word predict because, hey, like we're talking about children and babies and infant, infants and it's like unpredictable, right? Like it's like they're not sleeping mm-hmm. or they're crying a lot. And I just remember at times it was hard to soothe her. And so in the beginning, I mean, it was a bit challenging, but at the same time, like so beautiful. And I loved being just a mommy to her. Like I love being a mama. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it, it was just like this this disconnect there of, oh, okay, what was going on with my, like, it turned into some frustration there that kind of continued to elevate. And I I often just found I was at the mercy of my reactivity. Sometimes I would get like easily. And this was more, I guess, when she was um, older, like when she was two, one or two, when she Mm -hmm. would start saying, no, you know, no, mommy, I'm not doing that. Or it was often the little things like getting into the car seat (laughs) or taking a bath and she was resistant, you know, or, or saying, no, no, I'm not taking a bath or yelling and crying about it or eating her dinner, cleaning up toys, like those small moments where, um, I sometimes would fall into this pattern of yelling or blaming or shaming her. And, it just left me at a place of, in a place of feeling um, just even more anxious about it and not really being able to sleep at night because of this guilt I felt about, you know, overall the day we would spend together because I ended up like leaving my job when she was just over a year, I guess a year and a half to be a full-time like stay-at-home mom and it worked a little bit from home actually at that point, mm-hmm. um, online tutoring. But yeah. Um, yeah, just like me experiencing a lot of that guilt and the shame, I think, with how I communicated to her in those like fragile, tender moments. Um, Do you think at that point, too, that was when you were able to even reflect more on your own childhood to see sort of where where some of these reactivities, these reactions came from? Well, that's a great question. I mean, really not even at that point, I didn't even realize that it was um, like more about me and my story and my dysregulation or unprocessed pain. Um, it really wasn't until I started to, I mean, did a little bit of research here. I, I made the, I came across, cause I was like more parenting from that traditional approach. Like I remember using rewards and just kind of threatening and mm-hmm. bribing, you know, her or like a few times putting her in, in, in time out. I mean, I remember I had, uh, I hit this wall really when, um, I put her in her, in her room for a time out for something, probably when she was not even two and she just was sobbing and, like probably cried herself to sleep and the same with me like even after trying to apologize and talk to her about it and do that repair process um I just I hit this wall and I I remember having this like epiphany shortly after because I was uh learning about gentle respectful parenting because I'm realizing now like timeouts like we're not Mm -hmm. helping our relationship so I just had this epiphany when I was reading Dr. Shafali's book, The Awakened Family. And I learned, I thought, wow, it's like, this is oh, really yeah. all about me. <laughs> it was just at that point that I, it's, it's like not, not her behaviors. It's not that she's not listening um, and not cooperative. It's, it's really just about me and my response or my lack of response to her, you know, my reactivity. And how really I do have the power to change these patterns and how really it, it does come from conditioning. Like sure. How we were taught and how our parents were taught, right? 
So I remember researching, right, going to Google and just trying to figure out other alternative ways to communicate to my daughter more kindly, respectfully, so that she would, Mm -hmm. in fact, like cooperate with me. And I don't exactly remember what I, you know, maybe perhaps looked up, but I did come across um, Dr. Shafali's name and it was really about her and it just goes so deep, so back um, really into my like earlier, not like teenage years perhaps when I really started getting into education, just the way she communicated so beautifully and profoundly about uh, humanity and equality and justice and, mm-hmm. you know, standing up for our human rights in terms of like we are in a culture and society in this paradigm of believing that children are not deserving to be heard and seen and understood and respected. So she's here advocating for children rights, child rights. And I remember thinking that myself going through my teacher education program, I mean, there it's all about service and serving the children and doing what's best for the child. But I did see some things in the public school setting where the communication style was more like more Mm -hmm. manipulative of behaviors, right? That behavior modification style of, okay, we're going to train our kids to do X, Y, Z and meet these expectations. And I feel like there was just a lack of the opportunity for children to be truly heard yeah, and seen, right? I definitely ran into that myself in the public education sphere. Mm -hmm. And then even when I was in my master's program, part of, we we went through the psychology, of course, of Mm -hmm. of children and um, and human behavior, but Mm -hmm. the classes themselves, when we were preparing to be teachers, were so Mm -hmm. about, so much about behavior modification and controlling chaos. And even though... I knew those tools were going to be necessary in that mm-hmm. particular setting. There mm-hmm. was that part of me that felt the pull to question, why are we not getting one-on-one with these children more? And, and you know, mm-hmm. of course, I knew the answer. It's like we have mm-hmm. to standardize and we have to have mm-hmm. the classes be a certain amount of, certain amount of kids because we have this many children in the school. And so later, of course, after time of – being in that world and then having my own children, you know, the questions that I had had in the back of my mind came forward, which was, we're not really doing the best that we can for each of each of these children. We're doing what we're doing because it serves the, the comfort and the, um, and the ease for the adults and the system, Yes, you know, and that's where I started having that battle within as being an educator and being in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And I saw that when I worked on worked with kids one on one, that relationship mm-hmm. was able to flourish so much. And I was able right. to connect with the parents and I was able to connect with the mm-hmm. kids. And then, you know, you had this beautiful relationship that was built on mutual respect and trust. And yeah. and I saw how that could not be easily transferred to a group of 30 kids. Right. Because who has the time to sit with each kid one on one when you have all these busy lovely, energetic human beings that need mm-hmm. your attention, it's practically impossible. So that right. system sort of requires us to let go of what we want to do, which is to connect with the kids more one-on-one. Yes. And so I can see completely how you would have that same experience, especially being as aware as you are and conscious right. of how you want to connect and, and see children more mm-hmm. in their humanity. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that for sure. And that connection between, um, you know, that small group setting or just one-on-one where kids are really thriving Mm -hmm. and because they have that opportunity to, to just be seen and heard in that moment. And, and as you said, right, it makes sense. It's like we have, there's so many children that want and need that support and that structure that's container to foster a love of learning. And it's really also, though, have to do it in a way where there's classroom management and there's 30 kids and Mm -hmm. be sure to, you know, have some, obviously, that container where everybody is safe, you know, and and, uh, we can accomplish, you know, tasks and goals and 
and visions and things like that. But yeah, I mean, I just saw this. She just spoke so much. Dr. Shivali just spoke so much to my heart because I had always deep down loved education and serving the students and being there to support and guide and facilitate learning and inspire that love of learning. But the the structure was just too uh, rigid and not really respecting their needs to Mm -hmm. that point that I knew was so important, right? So for me, it was just, um, you know, I read her work and she was just so enlightening and advocating for this shift, the shift in in parenting paradigm, you know, shifting away from parenting from a place of of ego and uh, shifting away from uh, achievement and success, which is very like behaviorist Mm. from a behaviorist model of, okay, like if, you know, my child is making the grade or listens, you know, when I follow his directions or, you know, the accolades that they may receive means that they are successful or they are fulfilled when there's, it's not always the case. I mean, that's very superficial or kind of our culture of, or in our Western society, very like competitive and focused on achievement and success when you're the, there's a lack of understanding that there's so much more beneath like those superficial accolades or accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Like there's the emotional and psychological component. There's core human needs that are not being met, like the just the need to be understood or the need to be heard and respected or the need to really just be accepted and have that need to belong met unconditionally. Mm-hmm. Like even if I don't get a good grade or yeah. even if I don't um, go play baseball just because you wanted me to, or, you know, like giving kids that voice and the opportunity to just explore what their unique passions and interests are. So, but yeah, for me, it was in that moment when I'm having this epiphany of like, okay, this is me. And it's really not, she brought to light too, that it's not my fault. It's not my parents' fault. It's not society's fault. I mean, it's really just a culmination of something that's been passed down from generation to generation of this Mm -hmm. hierarchical model of, okay, parent knows best and the kids are really to be, to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I call that the adult knows all paradigm. And, and we all know that's not true. I mean, even, even when we are behaving that way, we know we really don't have all the answers, but like you said earlier, it's that ego. It's like recognizing what it is you're trying to achieve, what it is that you as a, the parent, the adult, what are you trying to accomplish? Is it yeah. to do something so that your child will do something to make you look good? Yeah. Is it so that you can brag about your kid? Is it right. is this self-serving when you are putting um, expectations on your children yeah. when it's obvious that they aren't able to either A, meet them because developmentally they're just not there or B, mm-hmm. they don't want to, but you're ignoring that, you know? And so I guess maybe what we could do is give a little bit more of a clear definition, definition of conscious parenting too, so that those who haven't really heard of this before, or maybe aren't aware of this, I, um, would you, would you call it a philosophy theory is, I guess it's a philosophy, Mm -hmm. um, and how it differs Mm -hmm. from what we tend to call mainstream parenting. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that word consciousness, right? Conscious parenting, right? Um, I mean, the word consciousness itself is to be aware. Mm -hmm. So what that is, is really to be aware of our thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and patterns in a way in which we're connected more intimately um, to the choices we make or to the, the decisions, you know, the words we share and how we're feeling in our bodies, um, as opposed to operating um, from our subconscious, from our unconscious, which, I mean, 95%, I think the number is, of our thoughts and beliefs and feelings are and our behaviors are operating from our subconscious, right? From that Mm. unconscious. Like we're doing things so habitually from our patterning, from the imprints on our nervous system that were passed down 
to us generationally, like how we were parented and how our parents were parented. That's mm-hmm. just in our in our blood and in our tissues and in our bodies. And that's so the way, you know, if our child is is saying no to us and like, no, I'm not going to eat that or, um, you know, they're they are giving us, you know, uh, that we're having engaged in a power struggle of some kind. And we just like unconsciously will will say things to our kids, like mm-hmm. cut that out or, you you know, I'm your parent. You have to do this because I said so. Whatever comes out, it's just in our – it just comes out, right? Mm-hmm. It's in our subconscious. We don't even know that we're saying this um, at, at the moment, right? So the consciousness is bringing to awareness of – through that reflection stage of, okay, um, why am I behaving this way? Why am I saying this? Why am I feeling this way? And is it serving me? Is it how I want to be? Is it in alignment with my highest self and my intention as a parent? So the consciousness, conscious parenting is is empowering in terms of it helps you really gain that inner safety and inner security because you're realizing that, well, I'm really like not I'm so much more than my thoughts and my behaviors that I actually have power to to shift and to change and to make choices for myself or to speak up for my needs or to ensure that, you know, um, I'm communicating effectively. Like we have the power to to shift that. And so for me, it's like the awareness of our patterning, that this is how the relationship might be um, in the moment. Maybe it's disorganized or insecure or, you know, there's reactivity and there we're using uh, blame or shame to, to shift behaviors. Mm -hmm. So the consciousness is, is coming, bringing into awareness of, of how we are in relationship to ourselves. You're, Um, you're making me think of a, an example to share that um, mm -hmm. was so powerful for my, for, for me and my daughter when yeah. she was probably about three, four ish, I would say, um, mm-hmm. we were, I was making breakfast and the way our house is set up is our kitchen dining room is like one big room divided by like a bar area. Mm-hmm. So I can see the kids sitting at the table and mm-hmm. she was working on an art project, which mm-hmm. involved some glue and glitter. And she mm-hmm. still had her pajamas on, but she had a long sleeve pajama um, top. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was talking to her brother. We were having a conversation. I was making food and when I called his name or said something, she turned to look. And when she did, her sleeve ran across her, um, her, her creation and got the glue and the glitter all over her arm. And then it spread Mm -hmm. it all across the page. And she got so mad and Mm -hmm. was like, why did you talk to him? Why did Mm -hmm. you do those things? And just got Mm -hmm. so upset. Mm -hmm. Now, had I been in my Mm -hmm. old body, which had not Mm -hmm. gotten a chance to really learn these skills, I would have Mm -hmm. been like, what are you yelling at me for? You know, and and just had like a tit for tat back and forth. But instead, I went over to her and said, oh, wow, you were working really hard on your painting and your creation Mm -hmm. or your your, um, creation. And and I can see that when you turn to look to see what we were saying, your sleeve Mm -hmm. went across. And I just walked Mm -hmm. basically through the facts. I didn't get into her emotions. I didn't get into whether she's right or wrong, whether I'm right or wrong. It was just the facts. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm sh- I said, if you would like my help, I think I, I know what we can do. And I just grabbed like a little, um, I think we either had a Q-tip or a toothpick or something. And she mm-hmm. was like, okay. And she was still mad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. she was holding on to that. And then as I was like helping her, she mm-hmm. grabbed it from me. She was like, I can do it, you know? And then she just slowly calmed down and she started, she was mm-hmm. sniffling, you know, she was really upset about mm-hmm. it. And yeah. then I just, I, you know, asked her if she was good and she was like, yes. And then I went back and started making breakfast some more, but it was such mm-hmm. a tiny, it's, it's a tiny moment, but mm-hmm. it, it was so profound because yeah. she was able to express herself, but didn't quite understand how to express herself. You know, she mm-hmm. just was working really hard, turned to, you know, and then all this, this, this big event took place. And, mm-hmm. and that's so telling because children are so in the moment Mm -hmm. And they also are so honest with their feelings. Mm -hmm. So they're not at that place yet where they can regulate 
and yes. and say that say, say to themselves, okay, my mom was just talking and she didn't really mean to hurt my feelings or she didn't really mean to do this or that or the other. They don't have that self talk in the way that we do. So that's why yep. this conscious parenting I feel is so critical because it allows mm-hmm. us that chance to take a breath, mm-hmm. recognize it's not about us, try not mm-hmm. to take it so personally. And remember mm-hmm. that it's the child who needs us to regulate and they get mm-hmm. regulated off of us. So would you talk mm-hmm. a little bit more about how that works or what, what the, mm-hmm. what that looks like developmentally kind of across the, across the ages? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that. And that just reminds me, of, yeah, myself of so many different little moments. I mean, just today, like my kids and I were playing that. Um, strategy game Catan uh-huh. and my son wanted to play but my daughter like just wanted space and mommy and mommy and daughter time and it ended up with like pieces being flown all over the place mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know there's yelling and hitting and things like that and it's the opportunity um, for parents to be able to hold space but with empowerment and while setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I know we'll get into that later because I know you're asking about like regulation and body um, and co-regulation, things like that. But it's, you know, peaceful and respectful and gentle parenting. All those approaches are about um, that, like respecting human rights and equality. Um, But conscious parenting itself, I think, just digs deeper into like the root of why it is parents unconsciously often react right and as you said like I my story is similar is like the old me would have just kind of just lost it and probably Mm -hmm. like sent them to their room or something but now it's the opportunity for me to as you said like the regulation but just kind of connect to what's happening in the present moment acknowledging what is true and guiding them, modeling essentially, right? Like teaching them through the way in which I respond and, you know, sports cat, what's what happened and model for them and teach them those, that self-awareness skill, mm-hmm. um, which is really so critical. And um, all of that social emotional learning, like emotional intelligence, like what, you know, I know you said you didn't really get into feelings, but like just what happened and it makes sense that you were upset and just kind of re- being able to support the kids to build up the capacity to the resilience essentially Mm -hmm. to be with challenge and navigate it with confidence and navigate it in a skillful way that doesn't leave everybody feeling isolated Mm -hmm. or hurt or you know deeper hurt or left without resolve like some resolution so at least it even if even if a child is feeling upset or worked up about some particular situation and the result, Mm -hmm. whatever they're wanting doesn't actually turn out to, to be what they want. So for instance, if they want to go out to lunch as a family and that just can't happen, it's not a matter of, oh, you didn't get what you want. It's more like, I understand that that would be something that you would like to do. It it can't happen for these reasons. It's a communication, but yeah. you're recognizing it, you're hearing what they're saying, and you're mm-hmm. offering solutions or maybe working together for a solution. So we can't go out to lunch today because of these reasons, but we could do it tomorrow or the next day. Would that work? You know, and it's exactly. and it's it seems so simple, but mm-hmm. there's so much baggage with our parenting that we have yeah. to sort through before we can get to that place. And yeah. and it and, and it does take time and it's never done. I do mm-hmm. want to encourage people to remember that this is not yeah. it's not like you know, you, you, you all of a sudden learn these conscious parenting sort of ideas and techniques, and then you never take a step back or you never fall on your face or have mistakes and, you know, go back and go, okay, that I did not handle that well. And I I know now that my kids are older, I have, my son is 19 and my daughter's almost 15. And we have gotten to a Mm -hmm. stage in our relationship, which Mm -hmm. I just love because we're so honest. Mm -hmm. And if Mm -hmm. I get worked up about something that mom, Mm -hmm. you are really taking this too seriously, (laughs) or Mm -hmm. they're just so honest. And I love it because you need that mirror sometimes because we do have Mm -hmm. a tendency to spiral. Our kids can spiral little babies, toddlers and, Mm -hmm. and four or five year olds, but so can we. And it's just about that humanity, that piece of Mm -hmm. our goals are always to help one another out. It's not one against the other it's together. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I love that the whole point is to be 
is, is like you said, to bring that awareness forward, to recognize why you do what you do and maybe where it came from and then how to possibly retool and go down a different path that's a little bit more connected. Yes. Yeah. I love that you shared that about the resolution and creative problem solving. And that's something that I work with my clients on and teach them this five-step process about how to do that part, like how to get to the place where we're modeling for our children and moving through the skill of conflict resolution and conflict management and how to navigate a healthy conflict Mm -hmm. and work with, you know, working. This is a shifting away from Right. I didn't talk about the difference between the traditional parenting paradigm, the power over, yeah, like do this because I said so, or even power under of just permissive parenting, like just kind of checking out, do whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm not going to be a part of your your life or not, you know, just kind of late sitting back and watching um, and not having the skills and the confidence to hold space, to set boundaries, um, to communicate empathetic limits, all of those things. But yeah, for sure. And I'm so glad you brought that up. And I mean, we should start off the conversation about how we are perfectly imperfect. There is no perfection here (laughs) whatsoever. And that's not ever going to be an expectation that we can hold ourselves to because we are human. And that's part of what makes us human is knowing our shadow self and Mm -hmm. loving, learning to love, like it's essentially learning to love the parts of ourself that we um, don't always like and don't always love and how, yeah, we're still going to, of course, mess up and all of us, including myself, especially like we have our days, we all have our days and um, where you might fall back into a default pattern and that's okay. I mean, that's supposed to happen. So as you said, it's a lifelong journey. Mm-hmm. It's a lifelong process because um, as we talked about, there's our society and culture has not had the opportunity to um, to be able to know ourselves and trust ourselves, um, operate from a place of regulation and safety and have these skills taught to us, modeled to us. Again, nobody's fault. But yeah, I mean, there's no perfection here whatsoever. Mm-hmm. No, no. Um, and and I, I'm glad you brought up permissive parenting because I have mm-hmm. for sure uh, had chats with people in the past about mm-hmm. peaceful parenting and, and some mm-hmm. hear peaceful parenting and they say, oh, well, that's just, you know, you know, they think it's like you never interact, you know, never intervene, mm-hmm. you never mm-hmm. hold a line or have mm-hmm. boundaries. And, yeah. and I have to very much state that it's not about not interacting with your kids. Peacefulness is Mm -hmm. not, like you said, checking out and just not Mm -hmm. caring or you don't want to, you don't want to hold a line for your kids because it might create some reaction and it might make somebody upset. It's not at Mm -hmm. all like that. It's not, you know, Mm -hmm. people always constantly holding hands and singing together. Yeah. (laughs) Right. It's a matter of rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's a matter of recognizing that there will be differences if we can, I guess I'll back up to say, if we can go into any relationship with the idea that we will have disagreements and that there will be some conflict and there will be Mm -hmm. some sticky parts, then we can recognize that it's okay. And then Mm -hmm. that if our goal is to maintain the relationship and to work Mm -hmm. through it, then we're going to be stronger on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to also with our kids, we model that behavior for them to with within um within our own like relationships with our fam other family members and friends and mm-hmm. how we may even struggle with our own expectations of ourselves so if mm-hmm. i personally am upset because something didn't happen the way i wanted it to or i didn't get something accomplished that i wanted to mm-hmm. i can talk about that out loud mm-hmm. and work through it out loud so that they can hear me taking those necessary steps to mm-hmm except that it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to and that everything is still okay. Yes, true. Right. That sports casting. Yes, just I love modeling. that. Yes, right. And that, I mean, that reminds me of, you know, you had asked earlier and gave the great example of just the, uh, the opportunity and essentially the intention, really. I mean, I coach my clients or remind them that you know, we operate and start our day with high intention, with low attachment to the mm-hmm. outcome, like high intention and low attachment, because we want to be intentional and reflective. Those are key components of 
raising our consciousness because it's it happens again in reflection. So sometimes like we'll just fall into our patterning and later in the afternoon, you're like, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Mm. But it opens up an opportunity for us to dig a little bit deeper, right? Like your triggers are here to teach you. Mm -hmm. Your triggers are not here to um, like keep you stuck, but kind of if we can open up into a place of curiosity, like, well, why did I do that? So there's the reflection there. Um, But yeah, I mean, parenting and Dr. Shafali says, right, parenting is not about raising our children. It's about raising ourselves. And Mm -hmm. And really that process of being able to reflect or even be able to during those challenging situations or the triggering moments, right? Um, we're always like humans are projecting their insecurities onto one another mm-hmm. <laughs> or they're projecting their dysregulation onto one another. So being able to navigate those tense conflicts with a sense of confidence and safety and security and being able to communicate and use your own voice, your, use your voice with empowerment is such a process and a practice. It does take time and it does take the deeper work, not just psychologically and, and emotionally, but also like physically in our bodies through our, with our nervous systems. So, you know, part of my program is about getting getting to a place of really understanding our biology, understanding our uh, physiology, and how to go back to um, nourish and nurture and heal, essentially, our nervous system so that we can access a little bit more of that, like, just essentially learn how to regulate is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And and it happens. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that's such a huge piece of it. And I don't think people really, really understand or appreciate mm-hmm. how physiologically we are, uh, we are as humans. And, and, you know, yeah. we think we, we, we are, especially when it comes to our education and, and starting school at age five, mm-hmm. so much right. is done in terms of the mind and what the mind can hold as far as facts and, and information. And, yeah. and the part of that the part of being human that is so critical to understand is what it means to listen to our bodies, what's happening inside of our bodies when we are interacting with others or interacting with information and these mm-hmm. signals that we're getting and what are emotions mm-hmm. and what does it mean when, when I feel this way around this person, but this way around this person. And so mm-hmm. being able to discern the differences in our emotions and our mm-hmm. emotional landscape, I feel like is such a huge part of the conscious parenting because we're really allowing our children to fully experience their emotions and their feelings Mm -hmm. and walking Mm -hmm. through them with them versus deal Mm -hmm. with it yourself or you'll figure it out or, Oh, well, you got yourself into it. You need to get yourself out of it when really it's, Oh, I see this is happening with you right now. Mm -hmm. Let's have a chat about it. Or I notice that you're feeling a certain way about this particular situation is there, is there more to it that I'm not seeing? Did something happen prior to this situation to make you feel this way? But it's mm-hmm. also helping our kids control their emotions because it's mm-hmm. not just a free for all, like everybody just feel what you want to feel and do what you mm-hmm. want to do. And it does, mm-hmm. you know, your feelings are the most important thing in the whole wide world and nobody else's feelings matter. You know, that, that mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's so it, that boundary setting, I feel like is a really important piece mm-hmm. to talk about because mm-hmm. what, we don't want people to um, to do is to think that you're being aware and you're helping their ch- your children through their emotions, but you're just allowing the their emotions to run the show. Yes. So, right. can you speak about possibly some specific examples, maybe where a, a holding a line or or a boundary mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. would be applicable, especially especially when the kids are younger because they are so emotional and you know can be very dysregulated. Yes. Yeah. Sh- sure. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to go back, if you don't mind, no, um, a minute to, to speak a little bit more about that regulation and uh, our nervous system, because um, that is an important part of the conscious parenting, because that's how our beliefs are formed, essentially, about ourselves, is what is associated with um, our implicit memories that are attached to our like self-identity, like the I am and your beliefs about yourself, which are formed in chi- in early childhood. And those beliefs are dictate how 
we see ourselves and how Mm -hmm. we see ourselves in relationship with others. So, and that is intimately connected to feelings, right? To how, Mm -hmm. to our body. So that's why um, I love this practice of being able to integrate mind, body awareness, right? A full um, circle, if you will, of how the beliefs that we hold about, like essentially our truth of ourselves and of the world are formed in such early childhood. So conscious parenting provides that opportunity for you to understand um, why it is you believe certain things about yourself or your children and how they're deeply connected to really essentially it is your primary caregiver or, you know, caregivers, um, that intergenerational trauma we're talking about and how it's associated with the feeling behind the thoughts. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's essentially be, so gaining that understanding of like, okay, um, I was responded to my caregiver with punishment or blame or shame. And that was associated with a feeling of hurt or pain. Um, conscious parenting allows you to hold space and, essentially process those unprocessed emotions, right? Mm. You were told and taught like to to stuff those emotions, which leaves you in this like chronic stress response. So you're feeling in your body that's that's why your nervous system is our nervous systems, all of ours are essentially um, you know, still kind of often stuck in that fight or flight and and chronically stressed. And those are associated then with some limiting beliefs or um limiting beliefs that really aren't true of who we are. So I love that part. And I just wanted to bring that up a little bit Mm -hmm. about how it is essentially so empowering because you can get deeply connected to your limiting beliefs, where they came from, and then it provides the opportunity for you to process it and release it and then put something new in there that's really true of who you are. So it really starts like the rewiring process of your brain and body so that In turn, when your children are, when you are triggered by your children or when, you know, they're storming or something and there's a conflict, you can physically in your body, like, be regulated. Yeah. (laughs) Be regulated. So it's a process and a practice, but there is, there are steps to it. And there's like, it is a skill that, that you can essentially learn. And through like exercises, you can, you can essentially like rewire your system, which is really just healing it and mm-hmm. get, getting closer to the truth of who we are, which is um, just connected to more empowering thoughts. Like, you know, believing in ourselves, I can do this. I'm, I'm capable and competent and which is really the truth of, of who we are. But so I just want to share that piece, but about boundaries for sure. Um, a huge part is, you know, I find that parents I work with, um, and this was actually a part of my story too, is I um, had a, more of an insecure attachment to my voice. And, you know, I don't, it was probably from traditional schooling or primary caregivers, how sometimes our voices, and as we talked about earlier, as children are stifled, mm-hmm. right? So, Um, When it comes to holding boundaries, communicating boundaries that come from a value of yours, like it's important, for example, to respect, uh, to have everybody's needs respected. Um, It's important, like I have the, we value in our home, of course, safety of our physical bodies, but also the value of respecting all needs. So we talk about, um, for example, like when my, when children or when my child might say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I want to do it this way. You know, I don't know, like going out to the car and getting ready to go to the park and your child doesn't want to put on their shoes and they just want to do it in their own way. But, you know, maybe you're meeting a friend, like you have an appointment or something. Um, so setting communicating a boundary with empowerment wouldn't be just okay well you can do it your way you know kind of like letting them do it their way um however they want to do it and not being able to communicate that okay we we value uh punctuality and we value respecting other people's time so we want to leave now um instead of having that come out sideways either just by checking out or by yelling it um or like forcing your child to get into the car, you're able to communicate 
that boundary with more empowerment and security in your voice. Like, okay, you're, you know, you've maybe validating their, their needs. Okay. I hear you want to like put your pink socks on and you can't find the pink socks. Like how can we make this happen together? And you're able to communicate. It's important. Our family values respecting other people's needs or our family values getting somewhere on time, mm-hmm. um, you know, connecting to it, connecting that whatever is important to your family. You can really teach the values that are most sacred to your family, but doing so in a way that is not placing any kind of um, shame or guilt on the child, like, oh, you're not doing this and uh, you should be doing it this way. So it, it also leaves space for them to uh, advocate for their needs and, you know, work with them on how to accomplish a goal or, a whole, you know, um, how to respect the boundary um, where all voices are still heard. You know, I think of I'm thinking of how my kids like love jumping on the couch so much. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> big, yeah. <laughs> and jumping on the bed and all those things. And yep. I keep telling my husband, you know, it's really time. We go to the playground a lot, but it's, it's really time for us to get something in our backyard that the mm-hmm. kids can climb on or jump on <laughs> because they keep using the couch. But it's so, I mean, it depends on the age of your child, of your children, under children under the age of seven are going to need that co-regulator yeah. most of the time because when they're dysregulated and they're communicating from a distance, like, hey, okay, come on. Um, it's time to, like, can you play on the ground or can we go jump outside and giving them maybe perhaps an alternative or reminding them of, hey, we we want to protect the integrity of the couch. You know, we don't want to rip the couch. However, you want to communicate it you know, that it's important to you to respect the furniture and not climb on it, that they're probably going to need close closeness, like physical touch or, hey, you know, that kind of softness that I know is hard for for a lot of some parents to access right away. But the softness, the the co-regulation there. Um, But yeah, the boundary setting is, is so important. And I started off by saying how I personally did have trouble uh, communicating boundaries was important with uh, with with that empowerment because I always didn't know how to communicate mm-hmm. and um, how to what, how to state something without getting like reactive. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's it's a it's a skill. It's something that has to be practiced because if we are detached from our voices early on, then we almost feel like we don't have a right to set a boundary for somebody else or for ourselves. We we almost feel even as what if it happens throughout our lives and then we become parents, either we overstate our boundary to the point where nobody has any flexibility to, to, to do anything because we feel like we need mm-hmm. that control or we mm-hmm. just feel like, eh, well, it doesn't matter what I say because, you know, nobody's going to listen to me anyway. Um, right. But when it comes to our kids, and I do think what you mentioned is a really critical piece to highlight, which is your family values, because mm-hmm. What a boundary is to me and my kids might not look like a boundary somebody else has. Right. Um, yeah. And I do feel like that's an important part to highlight. As long, mm-hmm. I feel like as long as you are staying within that awareness and that understanding that we all come at our, we come at a situation with our different points of view and our developmental abilities, mm-hmm. then we will work together to try to find a common goal and or Mm -hmm. resolution to something. So Mm -hmm. being that we homeschooled for all these years as well, there's so many things that pop up in my head as we're having this conversation about specific Mm -hmm. instances that took place over the years. And I will just say, you know, having kids four and a half years apart and one boy and one girl, we had um, a couple of times where an activity was happening outside of our home that we were invited Mm -hmm. to and Mm -hmm. one wanted to go and the other one didn't. Or mm-hmm. one would be like, oh, well, I kind of want to go, but I don't really want to. So it was, we had to sit down and make those decisions together because mm-hmm. I'm not just going to drag my kid along kicking and screaming because mm-hmm. they really are happy home. 
Um, Mm. And then some of it's a personality difference where some kid wants the activity of a larger group and the other one would prefer a smaller group. So Mm. we had to learn early on how to navigate those specific situations. Um, And then of course, as the kids get older, not older, I'm sorry, as your, as different families have more children and um, Mm. larger families, that is one of the issues I have seen come up with this conscious parenting and peaceful parenting. It's like, well, come on, come on, let's get real. I mean, you can't, Mm -hmm. you can't make it work for every single person at every single moment. And sometimes Mm -hmm. you just have to suck it up and they have to go and you have Mm -hmm. an appointment and you have to get to it or you have a doctor's appointment. And how, 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 what, what would you say to people who have that question Mm-hmm. when, yeah, that's the, a good point. You know, the reality is that sometimes we all have to just get in the car, and go to a place if it's a family, right. family member's wedding or whatnot. And so what would you say to mm-hmm. those who have particular specific instances where they feel like there's a lot of head butting and maybe mm-hmm. it's difficult to come to a, a, a solid answer for everyone moving forward? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, what I hear there is what kind of pattern, you know, there's there's questions around what is the patterning in that home already around communicating boundaries mm-hmm. and uh, what is the relationship that the parent has with communicating boundaries and how have they been communicated before and how have that, how has that negotiation process been navigated before? And those patterns can always be changed and shifted. So if it was a pattern of maybe like parent just deciding what to do, when to do it, and the the child not really having the opportunity to express their voice or opinion about it, then once the parent kind of shifts and allows space for a little bit more of that um, that equality there in the home, right, working with the child, mm-hmm. then of course it's going to, I mean, you're cultivating and nurturing their core need to be heard so they're going to love that opportunity to speak up and speak out and children are going to be advocating for their needs in all kinds of ways that really, um, you know, I mean, are not, are essentially in alignment with what's developmentally appropriate for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you have a five-year-old trying to advocate for her need to not go or to go somewhere, she's going to be whining perhaps or crying about it or kicking and stomping her feet about it um, or a teenager, you know, that's going to maybe perhaps we'll be yelling about it or, you know, the same kind of behaviors because, I mean, there's, it's so deep there because you have to also be a bit knowledgeable about what's, what is their brain development at that time, Mm -hmm. right? Their brain Mm -hmm. development, they have a little firing in their higher order thinking skills in their decision-making and planning and emotional regulation, essentially. So if they're fired up and saying, no, I don't want to go there. It feels unfair to me. um, And they haven't been practicing the skill of communicating with, uh, I call it nonviolent, well, I don't call it, but I practice nonviolent communication, yes. which yes. is Marshall B. Yeah, Rosenberg. Marshall B. Rosenberg's mm-hmm. work, right? And if you don't have the practice with that skill, sure, it's going to come out and it'll feel uh, chaotic at first. <laughs> mm-hmm. But there's, you know, again, it's a skill to learn and there's steps and processes to follow where over time, and it, because again, just a reminder that these are just patterns that can be changed and it's a new habit to be formed, essentially, if you want to think of it that way, which habits can be changed and new habits can be formed in as little as about like 10 to 12 weeks, right? If right. you really practice it. So, I mean, science has shown that and the empirical research in neuroscience shows that you can change your brain and body in as little as like 10 to 12 weeks. Mm. So, you know, things like, sure, getting... Uh, coming to a conclusion of, I mean, I think about that all the time. Like we uh, essentially, I don't know, many of the the decisions we make as a family, like we want to go to the pool or the beach or meet up with friends. And it's very rare that all of us are in agreement Mm -hmm. that we want to do that at that time. (laughs) So, I mean, it's just not part of the reality that you're, so we practice like all needs matter. And I believe that all needs will be met or can be met, but it's your needs might not be met immediately, mm-hmm. but it's the practice of advocating for your needs. And it's um, the practice of the respect, essentially, and responsibility that your needs matter, but it may not infringe upon the needs of another person. So we're working together. Mm-hmm. Well, and I have mm-hmm. seen just the recognition that you don't want to do A, B, or C mm-hmm. and saying, 
oh, I didn't realize that this was something you didn't want to do. I apologize Mm -hmm. for not asking you ahead of time. Mm -hmm. However, I have agreed to do this for your brother. And Mm -hmm. this is sort of, this is where we are. So Mm -hmm. how would you like to proceed? And Mm -hmm. a lot of times, if you just ask the question, they'll come up with an answer. It's amazing what their Mm -hmm. problem solving skills are. Even little ones, you know, as long as they feel like they've got an active, they can be an active participant in in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they it's not that they want to be left alone. They want to be with their family. They want to be with their siblings and, and the parents. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But that it's, a, it's so amazing how powerful that can be to just say, oh, mm-hmm. gosh, I completely apologize. I, I really just kind of bulldozed you there, didn't I? And um, mm-hmm. and I noticed, too, with um, when there was some resistance for a particular activity, it wasn't necessarily that it, they, they did not want to go to the activity. It's that they didn't want to do it at that point particular moment because they were Mm -hmm. already engaged in something else. And that's one thing that's super important, I think, for people to recognize with children is that it's Mm -hmm. not that they don't want to do the next fun thing, but it's Mm -hmm. that they're having fun right now. So they don't want to stop this fun to go to have that fun. And Mm -hmm. and maybe if you just say, okay, we actually have time. We don't have to leave right this minute. We've got 15, Mm -hmm. 20, 30 minutes. Would that give you enough time to finish what you're working on? Yes. Yes. And then bam, you're good. So it's just yeah, I love that. that problem solving piece mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. a matter of, as a parent, again, like we, we said earlier, not taking it personally that the child mm-hmm. is saying no or having, mm-hmm. you know, having um, a, a large reaction to something or mm-hmm. make you feel like, wow, I, I didn't see that coming and mm-hmm. turning it into a battle. But more, it's mm-hmm. any sort of behavior is um, a signal and it's an mm-hmm. invitation to dig a little deeper. Right. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Yeah, Dan Siegel, right, and Tina Payne Bryson, in their book, The Power of Showing Up, they talk about the practice of mindsight, Mm. which is really just trying to get beneath behaviors, you know, um, really trying to understand what's happening in the brains and bodies of our our children. And I love you gave that example of, sure, I mean, children are so, um, particularly when they're younger, but really they're egocentric. I mean, they're just so in the moment and thinking about their dreams and and what they want to accomplish and engaged in their play, which is such a beautiful thing because they are such fabulous teachers of accessing how to access presence mm-hmm. and and that the present moment awareness. But sure, I mean, if the family is longing to to transition to somewhere else or do something together, um, yeah, just opening, holding space and getting curious about, okay, well, uh, what is it that your child is doing in that moment and how can we make that transition um, and communicate the boundary and model, have success with the boundary um, Mm -hmm. by supporting them through it. So it might require like the question, hey, how much time do you need? Do you need five more minutes? Do you need two more minutes? I do that a lot with my children. It's like kind of that bit of back and forth negotiation, you know, you have to decide as a family which boundaries are negotiable or non-negotiable. And and it's important to model that flexibility and spontaneity for Mm -hmm. sure, you know, um, with your children. But I just think about how, um, you know, sometimes in the past, um, before I really started integrating more of these skills and tools and strategies, I might, you know, my kids are playing outside, um, or, you know, my daughter, she's highly sensitive. And when she's dysregulated, I mean, she could have really explosive sensory meltdowns and not not so much anymore because we did change our, our patterning a lot. But just thinking like if she was in a place of, you know, coloring in her room or playing outside and trying to catch lizards and I would call her, hey, I'm like, come in for dinner. It's dinner time. And, you know, we communicate the, the value in the, in the past of, hey, we value, you know, communication and we value this family dinner time. And uh, sharing stories at that time, she might not have the ability really uh, physiologically to to tra- make that transition on her own. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she might need that co-regulator to come over and say, hey, come on, like, can I help you to the dinner table? And okay. how can we make that happen together? You know, maybe if she's working on something, hey, can you bring it over to the dinner table and finish it um, at the dinner table? Or... Uh, just so that we can, ex- you know, have success, have success with, with mm-hmm. that boundary. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I think that's great for sure. I feel like I could mm-hmm. talk to you about this for like two more hours, but I yeah, know. I know. I love this. Stuff. I know it's so much to share too. I know yeah. there's so much. Well, and so before we, is there anything else you want to add to, um, to specific skills? Like maybe if you could, if you could wrap this up in a tiny little bow mm-hmm. <laughs> to hand yeah. to parents and say, right. if you've never done conscious parenting, you've never heard of it, or you're curious about adding more awareness into your own parenting, what are, what are some like top skills to just, um, to take away today? Sure. Oh my gosh. So number one would be, um, just caring for self, um, Mm -hmm. like uh, practicing self-awareness. Number one, I mean, there's so much empirical research that shows how self-awareness is, really so powerful for emotional intelligence and feeling more confident, secure. I mean, just thinking back to back to my own journey and not feeling like I'm doing enough or feeling like, oh, I um, I don't have time for myself, right? Or I, I have so much to do around the house, mm-hmm. um, you know, or responsibilities, which which those are all valid. I mean, you know, maybe you're working full time and you get home and you're exhausted. What is that little teeny tiny, right? We talk about habit changing, teeny tiny small changes you can start to make each morning, each day. Where can you carve out that like just start with something so small, just waking up and taking 10 seconds to take a deep breath? Mm. I mean, it might just be as small as that. I don't know where everybody's at in their in their journeys here, but thinking back to to my journey, it was um, yeah, just taking that little bit, little tiny baby steps to tune inward, to like look inward, um, connecting with your breath. I mean, I'm a breathwork teacher, so mm-hmm. I uh, I just am so passionate about the power of consciously connected breathing. And well, do you mind yeah. explaining that a little bit more? Because we did talk about the nervous system a little bit with the sympathetic mm-hmm. nervous system. We probably didn't specifically state that, but it's the fight yeah. and flight, sort of the action that your body takes when it's in a situation that it reacts. Whereas right. the parasympathetic nervous system is where we rest and mm-hmm. and we heal and grow. And so when it comes to breathing, which ha- was a life changer for me, I am not going to lie, mm-hmm. like learning how to yeah. breathe and deeply breathe mm-hmm. and hold my breath and all of those yeah. things. I cannot believe how simple, simple mm-hmm. that is, right. how, how, how much it changed things for me. Mm-hmm. So if you don't mind, right. just before we wrap up explaining that a little bit more. Yeah, sure. I mean, breathwork is an umbrella term for just any type of connection to your breath, like how you want to use your breath and in, with intention. Um, so it might be to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, or it might actually be in like my sessions, I'll do um, active breathwork, which is activating the sympathetic nervous system, which helps you process unprocessed emotions. So mm-hmm. help you um, relieve and bring up past traumas or pains that you're keeping stored and stuck. So it helps you get unstuck essentially. So there's, I mean, you can use breath work in those two really different ways to activate um, either part of your nervous system. But yeah, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for your homeostasis in your body, your equanimity, like just um, activating really that calm and home like that's our bodies are meant to be in that place of homeostasis and of calm and regulation and to be able to like widen that window of tolerance of not to say that we're just like calm all the time Mm -hmm. but um that you can build the capacity to tolerate daily stressors with with more um yeah with with a greater capacity to to navigate it. Mm. So your um yeah, your parasympathetic nervous system is just activate um responsible for activating that calm and regulation. And yeah, I mean breath breathing in itself could just breathing like we're breathing all the time breathing <laughs> now, but it happens it's part of your um autonomic nervous system like it just happens unconsciously. So the breath work is like doing it consciously, right? Just mm-hmm. think breath work co- breath work would be conscious breathing, like consciously connecting to your breath. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that could be hard to, to, to start there. And I, so maybe if, if that feels too intimidating, you know, you might want to connect with um, 
somebody, you know, maybe using like a, an app like Insight Timer or Calm to help do some guided breath work. I don't particularly recommend the meditation right away because meditation is more about like the thoughts or maybe like watching your thoughts go by. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to do that if you're not um, regulated in your body. So I, I advocate for more connecting to the body, connecting yeah. to the body, which is like through your breath. And um simple things like just regulating through water, you know, with water or what is like a calming sensory tool? What, what soothes your nervous system? So maybe it's like some aromatherapy, maybe some parents like going for a run Mm -hmm. and that feels like they're processing some emotions. Um, So I, I, I want to just encourage parents to start um, giving themselves some of that time um, and, like self, I guess, grace, giving that starting small with what, what is it something, what is something that you really love to do for you and, Mm -hmm. and giving yourself that time to, to access that. And well, like, like they say, you're supposed to put your oxygen mask on first, you know, yeah, and feel from an empty cup. So you have to, you have to find a way to ensure that you're taking care of yourself because you're also setting an example to your children about taking care of themselves. And you don't want to model running yourself into the ground and um, not holding yourself, having self-respect to the point where you want to care for the body that's carrying you around. And yes. I, I do think that's so critical. Yeah, just to just to follow that up with like the most important relationship you have is really the one with yourself. And being able to just be a little bit vulnerable with um, getting curious about, you know, who you are and how you want to be. And that really requires help and support. I mean, I found that and that's why I got a coach and I Mm -hmm. joined, you know, speaking with you and joining a community, like finding your Mm -hmm. tribe. (laughs) And it's it's a tribe of of whoever it may be to um, just support you, you know, just support you in your journey. Well, I just heard today on another podcast I was listening to while I was doing yard work, um, Mm -hmm. a really funny comment that I was like, oh, I love that. And it's the, Mm -hmm. and it was a conversation between a woman who um, works with kids, started working out with children first, and then Mm -hmm. realized it was the parents she needed to access and communicate with in terms of building a more foundation, a better foundation of well-being for their children. Mm -hmm. Um, And what was said was, you know, Tiger Woods, who's you know, by all, all measures, one of the best golfers there, there are, there has been, um, it still has a coach. And Mm -hmm. it was like, Mm -hmm. why do we think as parents, we don't need some sort of help? You know, it's not like we were parents before and we're doing this Mm -hmm. over and over and over again. It's that, so, you know, having a coach or somebody to work with you through something that's new to you is not Mm -hmm. a failure. If anything, you're just ensuring that you're getting the best support possible Mm -hmm. in order to Mm -hmm. do the work and to create the relationships that you want to create that do Mm -hmm. last forever or as long as you possibly can, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to share too that also, you know, yeah, finding your tribe and having that community is so important, but just to remind parents, Mm -hmm. um, wherever you are, and this might be, I I don't know, maybe it might be hard for some parents to receive this, but maybe you might be open to it, that you are really not broken and you do not need to be fixed, right? That this is just a pattern and you and your family can change those patterns. So there's nothing wrong with anybody in the way they, I know it doesn't always feel that way, Mm. but um, having a lot of that practicing, it's a practice of self-forgiveness and self-compassion is is so powerful too. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful beautiful thing to mention because Mm -hmm. people do tend to get very upset with themselves when they quote unquote didn't do it right. And then, you know, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of wonderful, well-educated people Mm -hmm. on particular topics that can teach us so much. And sometimes it can be overwhelming because you hear it and then you go, oh my God, I didn't do that when I was this age, or I didn't do this with my kids when they were this age. And so, you know, I, I, I just messed up. Um, but if we each can see it as everybody has their own path to take to get to the point that they need to get to, yeah. that we can be more accepting of what was and then be more mindful of what is to come. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's never too late. That's for sure. 
I don't think so. I really don't. (laughs) So how can people find you? Like, can you give us like, where, where are you um, on social media? And also if people would like to work with you, how would they do that? Yeah, sure. So you can find me first on Facebook at Erica Kesselman. And I do have a Facebook group where I'm coaching and supporting families uh, more intimately there. And uh, you can also find me on Instagram. So, um, you know, uh, Instagram is Erica and it's underscore Kesselman. And then you can go to my website as well. It's www.ericakesselman.com. And yeah, absolutely. I'd be open to um, connecting with whoever's curious about my program and see if we're a good fit for each other. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erica. Is there anything else you want to add before we, before we wrap up? No, I mean, just that I, I love chatting with you, Missy. This was fantastic. And you're so inspiring. So I appreciate you so, so much. And thank thank you for for creating this container. Every time I talk to you, I'm like, you're in the perfect, you're in the perfect role because your voice is so calming and (laughs) (laughs) your children probably are just like, oh, mom. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've been working on it a lot. And that's a whole other thing with, you know, she tell parents like singing and smiling. I know we don't always feel that uh-huh. way, like doing that, but <laughs> you can tone your vagus nerve so that you can access a little bit more of that. That's great. Softness and gentleness. Yeah. But that's such a thank good you. Way. I mean, same to you. I mean, I love chatting with you. Well, thank you. Same here. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and learned something new today and especially took to heart that parenting is not about perfection in any shape or form. It's about trying, about being intentional, and recognizing when a shift in focus and behavior is necessary. You do not need to do this alone. Reach out to me or Erica or anyone else you trust who can walk with you hand in hand and heart to heart. As always, stay curious, stay connected, and stay aware. Until next time.